You know, QLogic um, is a company that really competes with um, only one only one other person. And uh, what's the name again? It gives it an E. <laughs> Emulex. So, so, Q, so Q, QLogic mm -hmm. and Emulex have this duopoly um, around really essentially fiber channel adapters. Um, but having said that, I think I think QLogic's done a good job, John, of yeah. of, of broadening its its base. You so know, if, beyond you, the if you look behind base. Dave and I, you'll see the words QLogic, and what QLogic does is they make fiber channel adapter cards and also switches, and these guys are awesome people. If it wasn't for QLogic, we would not be here at Oracle Open World. We are bringing you live HD coverage of Oracle Open World, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, in depth, all because QLogic stepped up and gave us half their booth and paid for the internet connectivity. We brought the cube in, and we did the rest. So, shout out to QLogic. Also, EMC, the data domain group, What's it called? BRS? BRS. Backup Recovery Systems. Systems yep. um, that team, California-based, part of EMC, big acquisition. They are leaders. We want to thank them for supporting us with underwriting some support for us. And Intel. And Intel. Well. So, you know, really, really appreciate the sponsors. Um, we can't do it without them. We love doing our independent media, our organic coverage. Um, we're not afraid to say how it is. That's how we do. That's all the angles on tech here at Oracle. SiliconAngle.com, the reference point for tech innovations. Wikibon.org, where Dave runs a research team that opens up the content model that free content wins. Open sourcing the research, getting collaboration from the peers. That's the future. Yeah, and, and um, you know we've got a big team now, right, John? I mean, we're very collaborative, and yeah. you know we got folks watching this stream. They'll be blogging about it. Look for uh, the the. The, the blogs, the research notes, the articles coming out on, on this show. We've got an analyst, Stu Miniman is at uh, Interop. Yeah, we're covering Interop, we've got Java 1 being covered. Yeah. Um, basically Dave's uh, Twitter handle is dvellante, I'm at Furrier, F-U-R-R-I-E-R. -R -E Silicon Angle is at another Twitter handle. Follow those because we are going to be at the keynotes. Uh, I just got an invitation from Mark Benioff's team that they want us to go to his keynote. Um, we're not sure if it's going to be streamed live or not, but we'll cover it. It's Wednesday at 10.15. Um, Larry Ellison's keynote on Wednesday will be the one to watch. We will be bringing you live coverage of that. And Dave and I will be personally on the Twitter stream with the hashtag pound o o w eleven, And we will bring our game to that Twitter stream. We'll bring the commentary um, and some... Fun Some conversation, fun sure, and, right. and we're going to really analyze what Larry has to say. His keynotes, Dave, are always dynamic on Wednesday. Yeah, His he, opening keynotes are kind of like laying out the slide yeah, pitches. speeds and feeds, like you said. Yep. Uh, but Wednesday, he will go after some of the competition, and uh, I, I would predict. Maybe show a little leg, maybe. So right. I'm going to take a break at 3.30 because I have to go for a meeting. I'm going to let you take it on from there. I want to thank the couple hundred people, 500 people who are still hanging on with us. We had 2,000 earlier. Thanks for watching. I'm John Furrier with Silicon Angle and Dave Vellante. We want to bring you all the coverage. Top news from around the web. Tomorrow's the big iPhone 5 announcement. Dave, here is Oracle Open World. Oracle Open World is the second largest technology show behind CES in terms of numbers in the enterprise. How many people here? 45,000. 45,000. I think 120,000 was CES. Um, but and, in, and in Force, you know, Salesforce.com you know, show, for, uh, Dreamforce is, cl is getting close. I heard, I, mean, I thought it was over 30,000. Yeah, so there's a, there's a whole new vibe going on for the whole, these big tech shows. So for example, you're familiar with CES, they go to Vegas, it shuts the whole city down. What they're doing out here, what Mark Benioff is doing and what also Larry Ellison's doing, is essentially doing it in San Francisco by shutting down the streets, making a huge production, and what they do is they make it an event, they make it a party, they make it in an, a, an environment where people can fly out here to the event to get knowledge, do networking, do deals, and also party. I mean, they're talking about a Bloody Mary lounge on Thursday morning. They're going to be you know, offering that. So, you know, Oracle is work hard, play hard culture. I mean, I got to, you know, as much as we're critical in Oracle and we're a watchdog on them, Dave, you know, Oracle works hard and plays hard. And, uh, you know, they're the big 800 pound gorilla, but they don't hold back. A lot of parties tonight, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of deals going down. Um, yeah, they, they do not hold back, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I say, like we were talking about earlier, John, they're taking a lot of, what I would consider, you know, mainstream technologies, you know, you know columnar compression, flash, uh, 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 storage tiering, you know, storage offloading, taking things like that, but packaging them in a way and marketing them in a way that's very compelling, and yeah, making some pretty bold claims, many of which are true. 
So, top stories on siliconangle.com today are, right now, uh, most recent stories, Juniper Networks unveils Networks as a service offering. Uh, we're introducing uh, Junos, we announced, Jun Juniper announced Junosphere Lab. Obviously, Juniper is a big sponsor of Java One. I broke the story on Saturday that Juniper is laying off 3% of their staff. The company confirmed that there were layoffs, um, had objections with my 4% number, I revised it down to three. Based on my data, 300 people are being laid off. That puts the number around 3%. Um, PR people are trying to make me undo the new words. I made an update to the post, Dave. I'm not going to go back and correct it. I'll get the facts right, but the numbers are correct. Um, second story is HTC looks into security flow discovered by a blogger. So apparently a blogger discovered a bug in HTC. So that's interesting. So that's on siliconangle.com. And Clint Finley, our new writer, wrote a great post about Oracle trying to hijack the NoSQL movement with a big data appliance. So there, Clint goes into much detail about um, Oracle's land grab. And honestly, um, we have a story covering the eve of the iPhone event. Hadoop, NoSQL, big data job trends. Alex Williams starts to profile hottest jobs on the market. You know, I, I was saying on Twitter yesterday that DBA job title's going away. And you know, as, uh, as we were saying, the old, you, I don't know, did you hear the joke about the DBA who walked into a bar? No. A DBA walked into a bar and left. You know why? He couldn't get a table. So a little humor there for the uh, you know DBA. Oh, Oracle DBA humor. Little, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't get so, a table, you know. The, so no sequels where it's at. Uh, uh, DBA can't find tables, so they leave. So bottom line is no sequel is a real deal. Oracle's validating that, and uh, Clint Finley and uh, Alice Williams have the stories. And again, more stories today. We got hundreds of posts going out a week on SiliconANGLE today. A slew of content going out there. SiliconANGLE.com, uh, Wikibon.org's got two great research posts. I, I see there. a post. I just want to mention to folks. There's a post out on there on, on Traceda. Uh, Traceda is a, co a company that was founded by Abi Meta, co-founded by Abi Meta. Who, who announced Traceda on the Cube? Yeah, we had him on the Cube first at Hadoop World last October, I believe. Um, he when he was at B of A, talking about how B of A was using big data techniques in Hadoop for a variety of different things, game changing. Abi's very articulate. Now Traceda basically has a platform that's a vertical platform, analytics platform, really specifically for um, the financial services industry. And in a way, is uh, taking a different approach from Karmasphere, which is a horizontal platform. So, you know, it's interesting to contrast the two approaches. And uh, so Well, you know, and also remember Bank of America came to our site, Risen and I were talking, they wanted us to take B of A off the site because they didn't officially sanction the interview. Um, he then went on to form a startup. He's a great guy. And, you know, one of the things about um, Abby that points out the big opportunity in big data, and this is this is just my angle for all my entrepreneurial friends out there, is that the innovation around big data is so compelling that anyone can start a company from, you don't have to be a software geek to start a big data company because if you're an analyst, you have any kind of analytical or quantitative analysis and know an industry, you can leverage big data and change the world. And that is a new trend that quite frankly was not really available before you'd be a hacker. Now with big data, if you can innovate on analytics and have a speed advantage, you can actually create a lot of value. So, you know, Abi pointed that out and said in the financial services area, he's going to be specific about adding value there and uh, well, that's his focus. You know, we've been talking about this now for quite some time, how data and information is the next source of competitive advantage. Need, or, or maybe I should say lock-in. It's really not lock-in. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you know, for years, this industry has been focused on you know, operating systems. That's so Dave, what's going on in the stock market these days? What's the, what's, the, what's the stock market doing today? And uh, what's EMC, VMware? What's our, what's our companies that we like doing today? Yeah, well, the market just across the board got crushed. Um, you know, again, European woes, concerns about double dip inflation. Um, I'm serious about October. That's what happens in the in the, in the market. It, it drops in October, and you could tell, you know, toward the end of the summer, this market didn't want to go up, you know, and it was just sort of waiting for events. And now we're here in October, and I think it's going to be pretty rocky here for a while. But uh, you know, Cisco was down, EMC was down, Apple's down almost seven points, X, Exxon Mobil, of course, Fusion IO down half a point, you know, Dell down only a quarter point. I mean, it, you know, bad day for the market. Um, and you know, I would expect more. The, the NASDAQ is now trading around 2300 at the peak of uh, March of 2000. It was, let's see, right around 5000, wasn't it? So it's below. It's, you know, it's I, am so, I am so bearish on the stock market. I just think that Wall Street is screwed. I think the system is so effed up beyond all recognition, totally foobarred. 
However, tech is booming, okay? And I see technology sector really going to change the game in this, this, this IT economy globally. I think we're at the, at the dawn, Dave, of a new generation of culture that absolutely is going to use tech, as Bill Schmarzo pointed out, to solve problems from peace, hunger, energy, uh, lifestyle, and you talked about user experience. I truly see the signs that although it's very bubblish with companies like Airbnb and Groupon, um, well, that, that we are going to see a technology boom unprecedented. You remember, we just got to get the government in the right direction. You, <laughs> Can't be socialistic, it's got to be marketplace driven and we need lower taxes. Again, off my soapbox, but tech, Silicon Valley right now is booming, it's frothy, but real innovation, real profits being made, and the enterprise is making a huge comeback right now. I wonder if and I we, could. And we, by the way, we called it at EMC in May 2010. I wonder if I could get your take on this, John. I mean, you remember the dot-com boom, and it was ugly, the stock market was ugly after that, and, and, and tech especially. I mean, you had companies like EMC and NetApp who got completely crushed, and then the Google IPO, sort of created the next wave, web 2.0, social media, right? A lot, uh, yeah, man. A lot of good stuff uh, started to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that period from, you know, housing housing boomed. You had a no, run. No, I don't think, no. You had no, a run. There's been no run, Dave. No, from, from what do you mean no run? From run. 2003, when we came out of that, 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 that tech bubble burst through 2007, the stock market ran up like crazy. My question is, what about a Facebook IPO? Do you think that would have a similar effect or a greater effect? Because you don't seem to think Google Google's well, IPO had an effect. You know, I don't, I, I'm kind of a seat in my pants economist. You know, I've been trained uh, in business, masters in business, so I you know, have the requisite experience to kind of read the tea leaves, but I, more of my gut feelings, I'm not an expert, talk to other economists. I just feel like the economy is dragging along where the IPO by Facebook might not be a game changer. We're seeing people pull their S1s right now. They don't want to go public. Right now, it used to be when you went public, you raised, it was to raise money. You sold shares to the public because there was no other buyers of funding. So you sold shares to the public and raised like 20, 50, maybe if you were really good back in the heydays, like Netscape, $100 million. Now, you know, you know, <laughs> Box.net just raised hundred million dollars. I mean, Box.net is file sharing with the front end. I mean, it's just early getting out there. Great product approach, love Box.net, but come on, hundred million dollars, why would they want to go public? Now, I think they're going public because of all the PR they're doing, but that's another story I'll explain later. Um, Li uh, Living Social, Groupon, these companies, these, uh, Twitter, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Why would they want to go public? Facebook, I think, is sitting there going, why do I want to go public? See, when you go public, you got all kinds of regulations. You've got Sarbanes-Oxley, you have to put, bring your books to the street, you got to disclose. It's a real pain in the ass to go public. So, you know, if you've got liquidity in the private market like they do now, which is very liquid, I mean, a founder can get a company up and running in, in two years, or less than two years, and literally take five to $10 million out and put it in their pocket. Why would I want to go public? So, so, to me, public offering makes no sense at all. Um, you know, we should have this discussion with David Flynn. I think he's coming on tomorrow. Um, you know, Fusion IO went public. Um, you know, presumably, yeah, I mean, are they any lawsuits against them yet? Class action lawsuits. So, you know, I mean, well, I, I'm not poo-pooing public offering. I just think that there's no real public window. It's great for all the investors to get liquid in the public offering, but if you don't have to go public, why would you go public? Staying private is so much better. Is there I an mean, asymmetry between the, the public values and the private values? In other words, the private values keep going up and up and up. You know, stock market drops, but the private values keep soaring, whether it's, well, whether I mean, it's social, the only The only difference between the, the private market and the public market is, is that on the liquidity side, it's, it's lopsided. There's no real marketplace on liquidity. The, so the point is, when you have publics buying shares, selling and buying shares, you have a market to ma manage the price expectations. What's happening right now is that you have a, a irrational market because there's not enough buyers and sellers. So in these private liquidation events in the secondary markets, like uh, there's only a few people buying. So it literally is whoever's holding the potato at the end of the day is screwed. The people who are selling win. So, you know, that's how it works. So I'm all for people taking money off the table. I just think that, you know, why go public if you can get liquidity for your employees? Now, the Airbnb fiasco this past week um, was a big problem because the, only the founders were taking money. That was a big problem. And the founders taking money is not cool because that means the employees get screwed. So, you know, to me, it's about equity with the employees. If you want to take money off the table, that's cool, but do it for everybody. Don't just put it in the founder's pocket. Yeah, well, definitely I want to have this discussion with, with David Flynn and, and ask him how, how life is as a public company. I mean, they crushed their first quarter. That's good. 
And like I said to him, well, just do that 100 more times <laughs> and you'll be good. Because yeah, you know, yeah, the pressure yeah. is incredible, right? Yeah, I mean, but, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I, I just, that's my opinion. I think if there's a robust public market with, with fairness, that's cool. Regulation, I'm not a big believer of too much regulation, but then again, look at all the criminal corruption going on all over the place, and so it's, it's frightening out there. Let me ask you another question. What do you think, you, you, you were very outspoken, you have been a number of CUBE gigs, about the DOJ's impact on Microsoft. And I, I happen to agree with you, uh, some, some don't, but I, I think you're spot on. The DOJ handcuffed Microsoft and put some pressure on them such that they couldn't work freely. Well, do you think the DOJ might be doing something similar in the next couple of years with yeah, Oracle? No, well, no, they're doing it with Google. No, with Oracle. Maybe, Oracle has not yeah. shown a lot of market power in a very negative way. I think they're just a big, big monster gorilla and they take what they want. It's like a race to Larry. He's got his boat model, right, mindset. Win the race, win the day, collect the trophies, right? So that's Larry's model, get the trophies. And he's got Sun, HP will be next. That's my prediction, if HP doesn't get their shit together. Um, I think what the government's doing that I'm kind of uh, watching carefully is how they're handling Google. Google is under tremendous regulation pressure by the government. That's one of the reasons why Larry, um, Larry Page took over on the product side to kind of clean that mess up. And then Eric Schmidt took the role as uh, um, uh, ambassador because Schmidt's out there glad handing the policy side, making sure that Google doesn't get screwed like Microsoft did. Microsoft's biggest problem was during the late 90s, no one was mining the store down in Washington, D.C., so a little mob was formed and they came down and shook down Microsoft. Yeah. And Bill Gates was there. Now, I'll tell you right now, my little trivia is I was the one who told Bill Gates to his face that Janet Reno announced the indictment of Microsoft. I was actually standing next to John Markoff and Steve Levy of then Newsweek, and I said, Bill, I just saw in my room that uh, was at the Agenda Conference in 1997, um, or whatever year it was, 97 I think it was, he, he ran. All his cronies gathered, they ran out of the hotel. Yeah, no like, doubt. Watching Bill Gates run like that, he was blindsided. That was game changing. That so, 